Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's virtual program at our Celebrate Kansas Day event. Um, even though we've had to uh, sacrifice some of it to some rainy weather today, but we're glad you're here with us. I want to tell you that today's program is being uh, recorded and it will be available on the Kaufman Museum website very soon. It is also being streamed on Facebook uh, and that's available for you to watch it there as well. To access that, you would go to facebook.com forward slash Kaufman Museum. And it is now my pleasure to welcome fellow board member, Jenny Macias. Jenny is, um, will uh, soon complete a master's degree in Spanish studies and she's teaching first, uh, first year, first year Spanish here at Bethel College. Uh, Jenny's research interest is in the area of Mennonite immigration, not, I'm sorry, Jenny, Mexican immigration in Kansas. And so uh, here she is talking about the immigrants who built Kansas one spike at a time. Take it away, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon and helping celebrate Kansas. And I'm going to share. There we go. All right. It's gonna take it a few seconds to start. Always does this, there we go, all right. So the immigrants who built Newton, right? Um, if you've ever driven through Newton, know of Newton, or had were late going somewhere, this is the infamous train stop that'll get you, right? If you're lucky, it's maybe a five minute time that you're waiting. But sometimes on those unlucky days, you have two trains that cross and that five minute wait turns into a 20 minute wait. I think the longest I've ever had to wait there, I think was like a good 35 minutes because the train actually stopped for like a good 10 minutes before it kept going. Um, so I moved here from California and I was like, why is there all these trains that go through this tiny little town of Newton, right? You think there isn't very anything very significant about it except that we have a Walmart, right? Heston doesn't have one, but you know, Newton does. Um, but we have all this train traffic at all hours of the day and night. And I was just like, well, why? And even the mascot, right? We have the Newton Railer and we have Santa Fe Middle School. It seemed like everything was tied somehow to the railroad. And so I just started doing some research and just trying to see, you know, what was, what was the story behind it? And it kind of turned into this project that's become my master's specialization. And so we have the Newton Railer. And then I found out that Newton started as a cow town. It was like, you know, full of cowboys because uh, they would herd the cattle up on the Chisholm Trail from Texas. Well, they'd start down here in Mexico and then they'd herd it all the way up through and they'd bring it all the way up to Abilene, right? And of course they had to stop in Newton. And so that's where Newton really got its beginnings, right? Where it started to be established. Um, and then there was a transcontinental railway that was closer to Abilene. And so that's why they would herd all the cattle up through to Abilene. And so then they would board the train in Abilene and then go to Chicago. And so the ATSF decided that they were going to start buying land and wanted to expand the railway after the transcontinental railway was completed. And so they made all these posters, you know, saying, hey, come live in Kansas, you know, we have good soil. So they started buying land and they really started to push for an expansion. But in order to expand, they also needed a workforce. And because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the, you know, which was Chinese was a big uh, labor force for the first transcontinental railway to be built, the railroad industry didn't have a labor force anymore because Chinese immigrants were um, only allowed to work in domestic jobs. They were no longer allowed to work in hard laborist jobs. So what was the rail industry gonna do? What were they going to do in order to extend, expand? Where, where were they gonna find a workforce? So they had all these jobs. And so the first thing that they expanded 
using domestic labor was from Newton, which is right here. They went down similar to what the Chisholm Trail looked like, right? Straight down through Oklahoma through Texas. And they went all the way down to Mexico where the Mexican revolution was happening. So there was a lot of instability in the economy. There were a lot of people without jobs, um, especially in Northern Mexico. There was um, a lot of ranchers who just didn't have anything to do like to be able to sustain their families. And so, they brought them up on the trains and they brought them up to Newton and they started expanding the railways. Um, that is the very, very first track in Newton that's looking um, north into on Main Street. So you see the first track and you still see you have the wooden buildings, right? It was still very cowboyish, you know, you're we waiting for Clint Eastwood to come out, you know, on his horse from around the corner. Um, so it was still just a very small, small town, but we have our first railway. And as Newton kept going, it started expanding. So you could see that you could see here where they're um, ready to lay down the rail ties and you have now brick buildings, right? So it changed over from those wooden cowboyish looking um, buildings now to more you know, sophisticated uh, brick buildings. And so then how did Newton get its name? So Newton got its name from the shareholders of the ATSF. So that they had, they were originally from Newton, Massachusetts. And if you've ever Googled Newton, like I think when I first moved here, I Googled like Newton water utilities, like, you know, to get everything set up. And it took me to Newton, Massachusetts. Like, and so I noticed every time you Google Newton, it's very tied to Massachusetts. I was like, why does it do that? And now I know why, because they're very, very, very tied together. They're both the, um, named after each other, which is really interesting. So then here's a picture of Main Street. Now Newton's become this big transportation hub, right? We have like seven, maybe not, yeah, seven to six to seven train tracks going through here. And this is that same intersection from that first picture, right? So we have the train depot here, you have the Clark Hotel, the Santa Fe Reading Room. So very different now from that cowboyish town. So you can see the amount of, um, economic expansion that Newton was able to do thanks to the railroad industry. And of course we have the Workington house or the Workington mill, I'm sorry, um, you know, that brought that wheat into Kansas. You know, they were a big part of having um, an economic impact as well on the city and its growth. And of course it used the railroad to transport and so we have these workers coming and they're coming, they were only coming for about nine months out of the year. It was the good weather, right? The, <laughs> when it's not snowing at least, or well, in Kansas, it could always snow, right? We've gotten snow in April and May. Um, but so they would work uh, seasonally and then they would go home to their families and they were very comfortable doing that. Um, just coming to work, laying down the tracks, working along the tracks and then going home to their families. But at some point, the ATSF was growing so rapidly and needed to keep up with competing um, railroads in expansion that they wanted them here year round. So they encouraged them to bring their families with them and gave them the incentive of free housing. So the free housing came in um, boxcar homes, which you can think of kind of like as the very first like mobile homes, right? Um, it was just a boxcar with a door and a couple of windows um, cut out, and then they would put a wooden stove in it, and that was your home. And so as you can see, the very first ones, you know, they're still on the tracks. They would lay tracks next to the main track so that they can just park them down, and that's where the women and the children would stay while the men were off working on the tracks. And while his families expanded and got bigger, um, these neighborhoods, instead of being pop-up neighborhoods, just wherever they would just lay the track down, started to become more permanent neighborhoods. So you, they had the, the homes built from just leftovers from boxcars and ties, um, everything that the railroad would discard, that's what they would use to build the homes. And so these little neighborhoods started popping up along the railway. And in Newton, if you think about where 
oh, and the proximity here, I'll get to that in just a second where I was going with the last thought. But yeah, so you can see the proximity to the railway was still, to the railroad was still very, to the track was very, very close. So, I mean, I can't imagine being a kid and like literally having the train like in my front yard, just zooming by. But that's how these neighborhoods were created. They were just right there ready and waiting. So this is where the one in Newton is. So we know where the water tank is and then the Fred Harvey buildings out here. Um, and so this is where El Ranchito or the Mexican camp was. And you have the train tracks right over here. So in Newton, this is ex exactly the location of where it was. And so you have this, you know, community there that's just, you know, trying to just survive and, you know, make ends meet. And this was a doctor that would come in and make sure that they had health services and they would just live in their homes. Most of them didn't go to school because they didn't speak any English. And so it was very difficult for teachers to manage them in class. So there wasn't like how now we have ESL programs and such second language learner uh, programs. So they didn't really have a lot of education until there was nurse Kilpatrick she would come and visit and give them health checks as well. And then she decided that she wanted to teach them and help them learn English so that they can be integrated into the schools. So she was actually given an emergency teaching license so that she could teach these children. And so she would just come out to the Mexican camp, to El Ranchito, and just try to give them like the basics so that they can go to school. Um, I've done a lot of interviews with uh, residents who grew up in El Ranchito and they were actually hit an, in school for speaking Spanish. So Nurse Kilpatrick thought it'd be important for them to at least communicate somewhat because some of the students who originally started going to school would go all day without speaking because you know they had that fear of being hit. And so this way they could at least communicate to their teacher certain needs and certain wants during the classroom and really start learning. So of course the communities also had um, to practice their faith and they didn't have a church at the time. So they did outdoor mass um, and outdoor mass like today, it probably wouldn't have been a good day, right? To have outdoor mass. So it wasn't very convenient to have it outside but it was the best that they could do. And there was a priest from Hutchinson who spoke not a very good Spanish, but you know, was like a broken Spanish, but still it was enough that he would come down and he would do their masses outside. But the community really wanted to be able to have, you know, regular worship all year round. And so they just started fundraising and they sold everything from tamales, enchiladas, tacos, anything you can think of to raise the funds so that they could build the very first chapel, which was Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission Chapel, and it was built in 1920. And here's a couple pictures of it. So it was small, but it had a purpose, right? It had the roof, they could use it all year round. They weren't, you know, at the mercy of the weather to be able to worship. And then this is a picture done by Chris Palacios, which gives kind of the outlaying. After a while, those first boxcar homes, they were actually thrown away, torn apart, and they built brick kind of apartment structures, but it was the same layout anyways. It was still just a big room with windows and a door and a wooden stove. There was no running water inside and there was no, um, yeah, there was no running water inside. So they had a uh, outhouse in the middle that they shared and then they had a well, and then you can see the church. And then along this side, there was more buildings and then you see the water tank and out here would be what the Fred Harvey building. And then the little mission church chapel was uh, tore down and they, cause the community was growing and they were, uh, had got, outgrown the chapel. And so they did more fundraising in the very same way that they did for the very first church. And that's when the Our Lady of Guadalupe church that's there was first built. Um, of course, it's been expanded over the years now. It doesn't look like it did when it first was, was built, but it, this is the last church that, that they uh, fundraised to build. So in the meantime, while you have this community that's growing, you have Newton that's growing as well with it, right? So you see there's a lot of rail traffic. It really has become, you know, 
the center point, the bullseye for the transportation of goods and commerce in the United States. Everything, we had the big roundabout. So everything that had to switch directions came through Newton and switched. And you can see here, like that's our Main Street. I don't think in the 10 years I've lived in Main Street, I've seen Main Street have that many people walking down it. I don't even think Newton has that many people living in it to have that many people walking down Main Street. But that's how important it was, how many people were coming through the, the city. And you had the Santa Fe Railway, the ATSF, and so much economic commerce and power was coming through Newton that we had two presidential candidates come and uh, campaign here. We had Taft and Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, who both came. Um, I thought that was kind of was like, wow, Newton, we had presidential campaigns here. I mean, we feel like, you know, like one of those swing states like Ohio, we were important at some point, right, for uh, the country. So, like I said, things were expanding, the railway was still expanding, and then we have the Fred Harvey building, we all know where that is along the river, and then here's a picture of the Mexican camp, right, one of the buildings. And so, as, you know, a lot of the workers did work for the railway, the males did. A lot of the women stayed behind and got jobs, got jobs at the mill, got jobs um, at the Fred Harvey building because there was what, a creamery and um, there was produce there that all did it for the Harvey houses, right? For the restaurants inside of the, the train depots. But a cool, cool thing that I didn't know was that we also bottled our own Coca-Cola. Newton had its own bottling like little thing in there. And we had our own Coca-Colas that they would serve at the Harvey houses. And this is a picture of the bottle. You can see it still says Fred Harvey and Newton, Kansas. And so, you know, every Coca-Cola that was served at a Harvey house was bottled and then shipped from Newton. So here's a picture of the inside of the Harvey houses, right? It's kind of like, now I think when you drive along I-135, like every town has an Applebee's. Well, when you would go on the railway at every train depot, we had a Harvey house. So it's kind of like the original Applebee's, right? Like the first thing, like when you're traveling, what you would see. And uh, there's a lot of documentaries and a lot of books done on the Harvey girls. Um, and those were, you know, the waitresses that worked inside of the Harvey houses. And, but behind the scenes, you had the residents from the Mexican camp and you had, uh, the sons and daughters of those original rail workers were now working, right? They were working behind the scenes at the Harvey houses as well. So here's a good picture comparison, right? From the, uh, I think this is the late 1950s here, the train depot and what it looked like before. You have all the rails, uh, rail companies still coming through, the Union Pacific, the Rock Island, as well as the ATSF. Right, we have everybody coming through. You can still see a lot of traffic down Main Street, definitely. And then this is what it looks like today, right? Not quite as busy and not quite as many tracks as well. You can see some of the tracks have disappeared. And this is certainly not new. I mean, it's still the same political rhetoric we hear today, but this is an interesting letter that I found from the governor of Kansas. Um, and it was sent during the depression and it was just like, hey, you know, ATSF, we know that, you know, you're doing a great job expanding and helping the country keep the economy going, but can you stop using immigrant labor? You know, it'd be really great to give our fellow Americans, you know, good jobs, you know, economic stability. Um, and so the letter is dated November 20th and the, I found the response letter that the ATSF sent back two days later saying, you know, we will do our best to try to, you know, use American labor, but, you know, it just seems that, you know, Mexican labor, you know, they can withstand, you know, the weather and for the amount of money that they earn, but we will do our best, but, you know, we're not making any plans to make any changes. And they even give like an example of how they started with 80, um, in a chain gang and it turned into 18, like within like a couple of weeks. So the ATSF was really loyal to having, you know, the kind of workers that they wanted, hard workers that were loyal to the company. So the Newton still continues to grow, right? We had a uh, Woolworth, we had a Montgomery Ward, we had a JC JCPenney's, uh, there was um, a Sears, 
I mean, you think of now when you want to go shopping and you go, oh, well, I'm going to go to the mall. I'm going to go to Wichita, right? Everything Target is Wichita. Everything, you know, we want to shop at is in Wichita. Well, back in the day, everybody would come here because Newton had everything. And so you can see the abundance of people down Main Street just walking and shopping. And then you have this group of immigrants that live over kind of, you know, to the side of the town and they weren't allowed to shop at these shops. Many of the shops um, had signs that said no dogs allowed and the no dogs allowed sign was particular, you know, geared to the Mexican immigrants. Um, some stores would allow them to come and use their back door before uh, regular service hours or after regular service hours but most stores didn't allow them to shop, which was kind of sad. So here's just more pictures of the residents. You know, they kept thriving and they kept, you know, working and contributing. And this is actually what's left of um, the Mexican camp. There's just two small squares here that have the the mark of the original foundation of the buildings. There's no historical marker for these people. There's no um, anything, there's a what, there's a historical marker for the bloody fight, bloody cowboy fight on Main Street over by Anderson's. Um, there's uh, another historical marker for a brothel, but there's no historical marker for these people who definitely um, helped uh, Newton become Newton um, because without the, the railroad industry, there really wouldn't be a town. And without the expansion of the railway through these Mexican immigrants, there wouldn't have been a railway industry as strong as it was, let alone a city like Newton. And so I feel like just discovering these small little tidbits of history helps us see how different people have contributed in different ways to the growth of not only our city, but other cities, because this city, this story repeats over and over again. This is the same story you can see in Topeka. Uh, you can go to Wichita and you can see the proximity of the Latino neighborhood in Wichita to the train tracks. You can go to Los Angeles and Boyle Heights is right next to the river, which is right next to the train tracks. Uh, you can go to Austin, you can go to Topeka, you can go to Kansas City. Most historically um, rooted na Latino labor neighborhoods are right next to the train track. And it's not a coincidence. It's because they all started with like these boxcar communities. And so it's a great story. And it's just kind of like showing us, you know, Newton is a small piece in a big puzzle, right? That happened in the United States, which I think is super interesting. And that's really all I have. But I do, if you guys have questions, I'd certainly love to answer them or comments or any other tidbits of maybe something I was missing. Hi, Jenny. Say, I'm Aurora Mendia and I'm from Wellington, Kansas. Mm -hmm. and we had a large Mexican American community here that emerged out of the workers coming here uh, to work at a, a railroad tie company initially, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, by the way, thank you very much. This has been very good uh, information, and uh, glad to glad to hear you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, yeah, yeah. It's, it's. I found it really interesting that it wasn't just like the Newton story. It was just the story of a lot of cities. Like that. This is what what brought a lot of Mexican immigrants, or you know, to the city. Like you know, at, initially at least. Um, and I see there's a question on the chat as well about education. I don't know what year they were actually required to start attending school. No, I just wanted to get chat. Right there. Okay. Hi, Jenny. I'll, I'll go ahead and ask this question while people are looking for chat. I'm just wondering if the Mexicans were not allowed to shop in Newton, how did they get what they needed? Well, that's a good question. So they were allowed to shop in some stores, right? And some stores wouldn't allow them in, but they could use the back door and be like, you know, what is it that you need? And they would bag up their things and they were able to pay at the door and then leave. But it's really interesting when you think about, I always take it back to, to recipes. So I had a, an interview with um, a lady named Mona Menares and uh, she goes to church with my mom. And so she was telling me all these stories and she's like, have you ever noticed how our recipes are a little different here? 
and I was super judgy when I first moved here, right? Because I'm like, well, I moved from California where we have like a lot of authentic everything. And I moved here and I was just like, what's up with these like fly, fried flour tortilla tacos? And everybody kept telling me it was Tex-Mex. And I'm like, why? That's not Tex-Mex because I've been to Texas and had Tex-Mex food. I go, That's not Tex-Mex. I go, it's very Kansas specific. Um, and the story is this, and it's, it's, it's a necessity story. And it kind of answers your question is that, well, these ladies worked at the mills. And when there was overproduction or um, it was like a bonus time, they would get um, sacks of flour. Now, if you've made flour tortillas, they're super easy. You just need flour, lard, salt, and water, like four ingredients. Now, if you've ever made corn tortillas, which I've attempted once and failed, <laughs> it's hard and it's tedious and there's so much that goes into it. So these ladies had these sacks of flour. And so these recipes kind of evolved into something else. So it was kind of like, well, if we can't get all the ingredients to make this, we're gonna substitute it with this. So even though they weren't allowed to shop in many places, they just kind of did what they could with what they had and what they were able to, to have. That kind of answered your question in like yeah, a weird fun a fact way. Story. That's a yeah. great story, thank you. You're welcome. Jenny, I wanted to tell you a funny. My, okay. mother, my mother also made flour tortillas because for one thing, she wasn't a great cook when she came here with my dad. Uh -huh. And so we had a, a mill here in Oxford and that ground the wheat. Well, she would get, they would buy like 10 pound bags of that flour for the tortillas. But then she would use, and the bags were made out of fabric. Well, then she would use that fabric to make little dresses for us. And so yes. one time my sister said, well, I guess we were flower children way back. Oh, that's a great story. I love that. Thank you. Yep. Was there a question? Oh, is yeah, I, I know a lot of uh, people, descendants of the Mexican people who came to work on the railroad uh, stayed in Newton. But was there a time when large numbers uh, migrated somewhere else to work? Yes, um, when, uh, like if you go to Garden City, it's a little different because there it's not the, the, the railroad industry that drove them there. There it's, there's the, what are they called? Oh. In Spanish, they're called mataderos, um, where they butcher the cows. And there's all that that goes on in that, in that area. And then there's also, um, in northwest Kansas, like the beets, where they grow the beets and the corn, like they started doing that as well. So they would just they weren't they weren't just coming for for the railway, definitely the railroad. Um, but those industries, as though they grew, they kind of drew the same immigrant workers out that way. Um, in California, I know even though the railroad was initially first. After that, they had the Bracero program, which did the fields, right, across California. So your oranges, everything that was grown in California was picked by migrant Mexican workers mostly. And then I know there's questions on the chat. I'm trying to come up here and get them in order. And we had many Hispanic students. Yes, I've done lots of interviews. Like I was amazed when I moved here and I saw that there were so many like Latinos living here. And I'm just like, and generations like back, like we're already talking five, six generations. And I was just like amazed by how many people were here. Do you know if the workers ever experienced depression due to the working constantly? or to the racial issues they were facing. Yeah, there's actually several, there was a lot of, um, there was a few years where there was tension. I have some newspaper clippings. I just, I have a ton of information. It's just really hard sometimes to whittle it down to like the time frame that you're given. But yeah, there's a, there was a lot of um, tension and there was a lot of dismissalness. Like if they, there weren't, articles in the newspaper and they were never mentioned by name. It was always a Mexican worker, a Mexican camp resident. So it was kind of like making them off to the side, like less than. So I know that that had to affect them in some way. And in some of the interviews that I've done with uh, people who 
lived in El Ranchito, it was very much like they didn't feel as part of the city. Um, they weren't even allowed to worship at St. Mary's, which is where another reason, which just slipped my mind that I didn't say it while I was presenting, was that, you know, they, that's one of the reasons why they had to have their outdoor mass and why they had to build their own church was because they weren't allowed to go to St. Mary's to worship. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's just those divides. I mean, it, it's, you'd want to say that it's, a horrible thing, but it was just the time we were living in because it wasn't just racial tensions with Mexicans and, and it was just racial tensions just in general in that time frame of American history. So there's one more. How do you describe the Mexican American community in Newton since the 30s and decades since? Hmm. So the fun thing I found was also another uh, news article from the 70s and Newton used to do these things called fiesta days. And there would be a big parade down Main Street and like, you know, there would be um, like a food festival, kind of like the chili cook-off we, the, you know, Newton does now, but it was all like tacos and Mexican food. Um, and then it just kind of died away. And since then, like when I moved here, I see a large Latino community, like at church, you know, at Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is a church I go to. And I see now a larger community growing that isn't just Mexican, it's um, Central American. So you have a lot of Hondurans now, people from El Salvador. So it's definitely becoming diverse and mixed. But I do see people are more included. Like definitely we're not excluded in any way now from the city, right? We're not, you know, nothing impedes us from doing anything that anybody else can do. So I love that sense of, of cohesiveness now in the community, right? That we're all included now. So we've, I think we've come a long, long way from the beginning. And yes, that is actually what my mother did. Oh, with the fabric flower bags. I also remember the braceros as a child when we went to North to do field labor. Awesome. Jenny? Yes. Um, I, I was told that Morris Hogan, who ran Hogan's Sure. little bit of everything store there on Main <laughs> Street was, and he was part of St. Mary's Church. He was the first person on Main Street, at least, to hire Mexican people inside his store as clerks, working with whoever came in. Yes, I remember, I think it was you and your husband, right, that came to convocation last year. And we're talking, we were talking about that. And I, I actually have been trying to research that to see what I can find. And I haven't been able to find anything to like really document it. Like I wanted to find a picture. I wanted to find something to, to include it in there because I remember you saying that. And I thought it was like a very poignant point, right? When you think of the first person, you know, to say, hey, you know, we're all the same. We're all people. Like it doesn't matter, you know, who I hire. But yeah, I remember you telling me that. Thank you for bringing that up because yeah, I need to keep doing more research to find that so I can find some pictures and include that definitely. Okay. Jenny, we have a couple. Oh, sorry. Was there a, another question? You know, this is Paul Crable. We live in New Mexico. Did they, um, uh, when we recruited people out of Mexico, did they pick people out of New Mexico because of large Hispanic uh, population in uh, New Mexico in those days, of course. But yeah, like you're going to think that at the turn of the century, like uh, the 20th century, there wasn't, there was a border and there was a border wall, but it wasn't built to keep Mexicans out. It was actually kept, it was put up to keep, and the border patrol was to keep Chinese immigrants out. Like the very first immigration law wasn't to to exclude anybody else but Chinese immigrants. And so Chinese immigrants would come in and come into Mexico and then migrate up. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, like New Mexico and uh, Texas, they just had a free flow. It was kind of like, it didn't really matter which side you lived on because you just lived there. Like it didn't really matter what side you worked on. So it was very free, free flowing. Um, as far as coming straight from Mexico, I'm not very sure if there was, I mean, I'm pretty sure if it was a good job, they were gonna move. Um, but I don't know specifically like if that was a state they would target or where they would pick up a lot of workers. I just know that a lot of Mexican 
people came during the revolution, especially that lived up close to those border states because of the Mexican revolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, Jenny, I just wanted to say uh, regarding your statement about the, the border. Well, yeah. my, my grandmother immigrated here in 1925. And uh, we have been able to find documentation of her crossing the border. So people were, it was noted that they crossed, that they weren't prohibited from crossing. Right. Uh, and she did come during a period of unrest in, in Mexico. And also my great grandmother uh, who lived in what is now, well, what still is Leon, the, Guanajuato, the state of Guanajuato. Yeah. They would cross the border in California. You know, they would just cross yeah. and, and then go back, cross again to visit family, cross again, back and forth. So we have a great number of relatives in California as well. But um, at that time, there was no, there was no, how should, restriction on the, the crossing of the border. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There was a, it's like a very large, there's a few decades there where it was, it was really the only restriction was that and then Eastern European immigration, like there was a quota, like there was only a certain number or you had to have like a certain way. Like I know for Chinese, it was only males um, that could, that could immigrate and like only certain ages and they were restricted in what jobs they could do. Um, so yeah, like, you know, you think about when we talk about borders and we talk about border wall now, it's always, you know, to keep out Latinos or Mexicans or, you know, anybody south of that, that imaginary line there. But at some point, it didn't really matter, right? We could just all co-mingle and it, there was no, no, like, hey, you don't belong. <laughs> and there was one thing else I wanted to say. Uh, the reason that, uh, at least in Wellington, there is a point at which, and there is a couple that still are married that were the first couple that intermarried, the Mexican-American community and uh, a, a white young man. And so after that, after that happened, well, then more and more happened. And then it's like, we're more or less assimilated. <laughs> right, it's like a snowball effect kind of, right? Yeah. Oh, and I'm glad you used that word assimilation too. Like there was this, uh, St. Mary's had a program after, I think it was like in the forties or in the fifties where they would come and they would help some of the newer immigrants, like really get into like what the customs were learning English a better, um, especially with the mothers so that they were able to understand their children since most of them were already starting to go to school. They would come home and they would speak English so that they would know, you know, what their child was saying. Um, also, you know, like customs and how things worked. Um, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of after interaction that, that helped out definitely the community and then the community actually, you know, helped out the city as well. Was there? There's a few questions on, um, on Facebook the chat. Live. Oh, okay. Um, a couple with uh, wondering about pictures you showed. Um, one mm -hmm. is the, the building foundations in the one of the pictures you showed. Is that at the concrete plant? Yeah, that's at the concrete plant. Yeah, that's all that's left. That's the only thing that's left showing these people ever lived there. Well, it sounds like a plaque is called for. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> there was a there was a lot of movement on it about almost two years ago now, um, but there was a lot of discussion about where the city wanted to put it. They wanted to put it where Our Lady of Guadalupe sits now, which is over down on Poplar a few blocks, right? It's like I think Poplar and like Southwest Fifth, Southwest Fourth, like all the way down there. It's nowhere near where they actually was, right? It's not, it doesn't, for me, I like for me, I was one of the ones that, you know, I didn't want it there because it doesn't show the danger these people lived in, the real conditions these people were 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 put in, really. Like, you know, they were literally right next to the train tracks. Like their houses vibrated when the train track, when the train would come down the track, right? You could hear the whistle blow. We knew the roundabout was right across the street, the huge roundabout. Um, and that was a lot of noise. I mean, you have to think about it. And I think 
to pay homage to something or to historically mark something, it should just be where it was. Um, and so that's been what's been the holdup is that debate is to whether put it actually where it should go or where I feel it should go, in my opinion, <laughs> or by the church. And another photo question, um, the photo that had all the people on Main Street, was that a special festival or just a regular day of business? Was it the one where, oh, I wonder if it's, well, the one that was from like 1911, the really old, old one, I have no idea. And the younger, the, the younger one, <laughs> the more recent one, the one that had the World War sign, it was just a regular day of business. It wasn't a festival day or anything. Let me check the checks. I think there was one. I don't want to miss anybody. Flower bags. There was a grocery store that catered to the Mexicans that are on West First Street. I think it was called Cook and Ferrell's. Ooh, I'm going to write that down because now I'm going to look for that. Cook and Ferrell's. Thank you for whoever wrote. I didn't miss the name before I closed the chat. Cook and nice yes yes and if you guys have any like little tidbits like that please please send those to me I'm always trying to expand and include as much information as I can um I've given many different versions of this and take our little town of Newton everywhere when I present this both academically and just you know like this informally but I think it's super important to try to include as much as we can right it's, it's how we preserve our history there are a couple comments on Facebook um, saying that we need to resume Fiesta Day when the pandemic right? is over. Right, I think so too. Oh, the picture with all the people had Pioneer Day. Had one had Booster Day written on it, I think. Yeah, and I think it's the old timey one. I'm trying to think. Oh, I can't look because I'm on this. And I'm afraid I'll mess it up if I go back and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> the zoom but yeah the old old one the black and white one i know it said booster day on it but the other one the woolworth one i think it was just a regular day um question on facebook is there anywhere we can see your collection of information no it's not anywhere i know sometimes or uh, the his, the Kansas Historical Society here on Main Street, they've done um, special exhibitions where they'll pull out a lot of pictures and have everything out. They've done it, I think, three times since I've lived here in the last 10 years. Um, I know that the library did something about a year ago, too, where they pull out all of this stuff. But there isn't anywhere. Oh, WSU actually, um, a prof my professor and advisor, he's doing, he wrote a book. It's not specific about Newton, but it is about the same topic about immigration in the Midwest. Um, and there, I believe if you go to WSU and like you put in like Mexican immigration or something, the site pops up and there's some information there. It's not as Newton specific <laughs> as mine is, but definitely there's more information out there. Harvey County census shows eight, 10% Hispanic. The thing, the funny thing about here, um, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about that. Okay. So the funny thing about how, how the census works is you self-identify, right? Um, when I fill out the census, I say I'm Hispanic, right? I'm white racially and then Hispanic when it comes to your nationality. My sister doesn't do that she doesn't self-identify as Hispanic. So because you self-identify, it all really has to do with how you see yourself in the world and how you fit into the world. So for me, a lot of the times when I see those census numbers, I have that in mind, that it's how you identify. So somebody who's already fifth, sixth generation may not identify as Hispanic anymore because like my kids have trouble identifying that way because they don't speak Spanish anymore. 
which was my bad for not teaching them, <laughs> being a Spanish teacher, and not trying to go back that they're older and teach them like it's not as fun as it would have been if they were little. But that's kind of what happens with, with immigrants is that we lose that sense of where we came from and it just becomes this. Like most um, Europeans, they're not gonna say, oh, I'm Italian. They're just gonna say, I'm American now, right? You're just American. And so you kind of lose that through the generations. That wasn't a question, but I elaborated on the comment. <laughs> Thank you. Question from Facebook, what brought you to Newton? Oh, what brought me to Newton? That's an even funnier story. <laughs> so uh, my parents were looking to retire, but they were looking to retire in California. Like they wanted to move like to the mountains somewhere or like the desert somewhere in California. And my grandfather was living in Houston at the time with one of uh, my aunts. And they had always made the trip taking I-40. So they would take, you know, Arizona, New Mexico and come down that way. Well, this time my dad had the brilliant idea saying, hey, I wanna go through Colorado and see the mountains and go through Utah. And well, when you come that way, well, you have to go down I-135, right? To come down. And they had my daughter who at the time was like two years old, I think two or three years old. And so you're thinking, all right, they've been in the car now for like 18 hours um because they drove down because they're crazy like that and they have a two-year-old with them and they stopped at Applebee's <laughs> to eat here in Newton and my dad's like oh well we need to find a park or something like you know for her to run around so she can like take a nap in the car and they were driving around Newton and my dad's like this looks like the Universal Studios back lot like every house is different there's all these big trees everything's like you know different there's art there's old architecture with new architecture she, and they just thought it was so cool they saw this house and my dad like is real really into real estate and so he was like well let's just call the real estate agent we're not doing nothing and the funny thing is that in newton you still have rabbits and you still have like squirrels and so my daughter was like running around chasing the squirrels and the rabbits like having a ball and so my parents ended up putting an offer on the house while they were just letting my daughter play they drove down to Houston and the second day they were in Houston, they got a call saying that the offer was accepted. So on the way home, instead of taking I-40, they took, they went the same route home to stop in Newton and sign the paperwork. And they came home and said, hey, we're retiring to Kansas. <laughs> and so when they retired to Kansas, um, I thought, you know, I came in, I came to visit a few times and I was just like, you know what, this is a really nice place to raise kids. Everybody waved at you. You guys still had the old Dylans. Oh my God. I used to love that old Dylans, you know, with the old conveyor belt, like uh, <laughs> checkout. I used to love it. I was like, it was like a throwback. I loved it. And so after visiting a few times, I was just like, you know what? I'm like, this is where I would like to raise my kids, like in a different environment. It was like, really respectful on Sundays, like everything's closed, only church parking lots are full. Like you don't see that in California anywhere. So I, that's what brought me to Kansas was just, and to Newton specifically, Newton, you know, stole my heart after a few visits. I was just like, this is where I wanna raise my kids. And here I am and people say, are you ever gonna come back? And I'm like, nope, this is home now. This is it. Cool, cool. <laughs> Long, funny story. Well, I'm glad you chose to come to Kansas. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I love it. It's you get all four seasons here too. I love it. It's you get the bloomings, you get the fall, you get the snow, you get the summer. I mean, it's very, very flat, which is nice too, because you get clean air. Like people always complain about the wind, but I'm like, you guys don't have gray skies, you guys don't have green skies. In California, we have that because we don't get as much air, especially if you live in a valley, it just kind of all sinks in there. It's gross. <laughs> tornadoes, hit tornadoes as well. Yeah, I've been lucky. I've been blessed. I haven't seen one, been through one. But I think I did bring the earthquakes with me because now all of a sudden there's earthquakes, right? Yes, our family lives in Wichita and uh, they were, they called us up about those earthquakes occurring relatively close to where they live. 
Are they extending up into Newton, the earthquakes? I think I've only felt one or two, but I work in uh, Wichita as well. And so like the, I was like, one was a few weeks ago, right? Like three or four mm -hmm. weeks ago. Like it really shook the whole building. Like I was sitting in my classroom and I was just like, it shook. And I was like, wait, I was like that wasn't an earthquake. I was like, this is Kansas. That's not, that was like the first time I felt a real earthquake. Not like, ooh, am I dizzy? It was like a real one, like shook the walls. I was just like, wow. I was like. Oh, there's something on the chat. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'll read it. I'm delighted that you and your family feel so welcome. And thank you for caring enough to research the history of your new hometown. Oh. <laughs> We still have a little bit more time for questions. If anyone still has something they want to ask, you can turn on your video or uh, drop it in the chat. Well, I, I was noticing when I um, went to the Kaufman Museum webpage, there's apparently a mural there by a man named Oasis. And it does. Uh, indicate a lot of aspects of Mexican American life. And that could really be a mural that could be in any community that was uh, tied uh, to the railroad. But one of the things it does have is it has a baseball player. And there were a lot of Mexican American uh, baseball playing leagues, some of them connected to the Catholic churches. Uh, I guess yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was just, uh, I, don't mean, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, like the biggest uh, softball tournament is the Mexican-American softball tournament that Newton hosts every, what is it, 4th of July weekend, right? They come from everywhere to play softball here. And so that's, that's yeah, a really big deal. And I think that mural is, I think it's done by, didn't Mr. O, the old art teacher from Newton High School do that? Yeah, right, Mr. O. Um, He's a very good friend of mine. And like, he's the one that like encouraged me too. He's like, because I had, he would come, my parents used to have a store here in Newton with Mexican food and like goods, like a grocery store. And he used to come in and he's like, he's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I was like going to school. He's like, well, what are you going to research? And I'm like, I don't know. He's like, well, research something you're passionate about. Re research something that interests you. Um, and he was just telling me about like, you know, the, the community here and how he met his wife here because he's from California too. So it's kind of like, you know, we had like that, you know, hey, we're both like not from here, but now we are here kind of vibe going. Um, and definitely like, yeah, he was a huge help and inspiration to me, Mr. O. Mr. O is a great guy too, yeah. And I think he's done another mural too on one of the buildings, right? On Main Street as well, or off of Main Street, the Sunflower one, yeah. He's amazing. There's a lot of amazing people in Newton, let me tell you. I've been thoroughly blessed to meet so many good people here. I just wanted to say, uh, this is Liz Friesen. Uh, Dwayne was Friesen. Um, the mural actually is at Sunset School on the wall. And it was done by uh, Ray and um, um, Pat Elias. Elias. And uh, it, it was moved there. Uh, some of them were in their garage, actually. It wow. was moved there when um, one of the state, um, I guess you'd call it mandates, was a curriculum was that we needed to study, uh, and I was a third grade teacher at that time, uh, three different ethnic groups. And of course, one of those would be the um, Mexican, Hispanic community, and Latino community. And so Ray and Patrice would often come to the schools. And um, eventually, we had it moved to the wall at Sunset School. And it is still there. That's where it is. Uh, it's not at the museum, I don't think, um, unless it's a, a, a replica or a duplicate. Uh, it's huge. It's very, very big. It's like... Um, oh, I don't know, um, 10 by 20 feet or something like that.
but you can go into Sunset School and see it on the wall. Oh. And uh, it, it has all the different aspects of um, families uh, in, in Newton and uh, their heritage from the dances to the church, to the weddings, to um, celebrations of all kinds. It's absolutely fabulous. Yes, it is. No, I didn't know where exactly it was located, but it was, it's on the web page for today's Kansas Day uh, event. Yeah, I've seen that one at Sunset because my kids all went to Sunset. <laughs> my kids all went to Sunset School. So yeah, I remember, I know that, I know that mural very, very well, very well. And then my kids were still, my, my daughters were still lucky enough to have Mr. O as their art teacher. So that was cool. My son, unfortunately, will not, but my girls did. Well, uh, this is Chuck Regeer from Coughlin Museum. And I'll just weigh in on the mural conversation here. Um, what we have at the museum is a reproduction, a banner that we've made. So it was it was for the exhibit that we have up now uh, that was with the Crossroads exhibit. But it's a it's a mural that we hope can also be used uh, outside, like like uh, attached to the outside of the baseball stadium during during the the uh, uh, yeah the tournament and that kind of thing. Yeah. So yes. it's, a, it's a smaller size. It's like four foot high by 16 foot wide, something like that. That's awesome. So it's just a very, it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful mural. There's a, a comment I wanted to make. Um, the experience that early um, Mexican Americans had with the Catholic Church on their arrival here in this country has totally reversed now. Uh, initially, they were, for instance, in Wellington, the history that I've read that was written by a priest here when he was basically stationed here is that they would be uh, asked to move to the back pews and then uh, after that happened for a while, the Mexican American community decided to build its own church on the east side because the most of the Mexican Americans lived on the east side next to what was then the roundhouse. And uh, these uh, Mexican Americans, my ancestors, and a lot of people's ancestors contributed so much to the economy of this country and they were rejected that now, for instance, in the Catholic Church, there are predominance, there are a predominance of the congregants in the Catholic Church. But of course, nationally, they're, they've become targets. Uh, and then the wall idea came into being. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So what I'm basically saying is that Catholic Church has now come to appreciate the existence of Mexican Americans and now Hondurans, Venezuelans, Central Americans, because they have become the congregants of the churches in a great percentage. Yeah, like when I present this more in an academic setting, like I always use the word histories because when you think about it, we go through school and we learn one perspective of history, one story. One but story. right now there's, I don't know how many people on here. Let's just say there's 50 people on here watching right now. And we're all looking at the same thing at the same point in time. But when we walk away from this experience, we each experienced it differently and we'll explain it differently and we'll have different feelings about it. And so history is the same way. So I always tell my students, like, you have to question it, like, hey, that was one person's point of view, or that was one group of people's point of view. But I'm sure there were more groups of people who had a different point of view about that same event. And so history, for me, that's how I always feel it. It's a perspective. And so you want to have all these perspectives, and then you have a more cohesive understanding of what 
really happened or could or could have happened or transpired. Does that make any sense? Like, because we all live it and breathe it in a different way. And I mean, for me, that's why this became like a passion project and why I'm still doing it, even though I'm just about done with my master's is that it's sharing it. I mean, why am I, why should I be the only one that gets to know all this cool stuff, right? Like Coca-Cola and Newton, right? And if I don't say it, who else will? So that's why I do it. I just say, it's like, you know, a drop in the bucket and it'll trickle out because now all you guys know about the cool Coca-Cola that happened in Newton and you guys will go share that too. And it just kind of, you know, keeps going. You're welcome. And I got to thank you in the chat. Well, we are right at um, three o'clock. So Jenny, if you don't have anything else to add, um, maybe we will no. wrap this up. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I just noticed that at some point there was three pages of people, which is awesome. Thank you so much for listening and taking time to, to you know, listen to my stuff. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, thank you oh, so much for you. presenting today and um, yeah, compiling and, uh, this presentation. With it this presentation will be on the museum website and when would that, might that be? Yeah, so it will um, be posted on coffinmuseum.org um, within the next day or two. It, um, as soon as this uh, meeting is over, it will be um, stored on Facebook. We were streaming this to Facebook Live. Um, so yeah, it'll be on Facebook immediately. And, and what, uh, is that Kaufman Museum backslash what? Uh, it'll be facebook.com forward slash Kaufman Museum. And is there something on the other side of the slash? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>